Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Welcome back to the Low Carb MD Podcast. We are commercial free in the Five years we have been doing this. We have not taken any outside funds, uh, completely self-funded and funded by listeners. I'm just proud to be here today. Actually, somebody I met at Obesity Week, uh, which was uh, an incredibly large but dark conference on obesity, looking to tackle obesity. Uh, a couple of areas of bright light and uh, that you know, I always think deserve to be sort of highlighted and would love to tease out more. Today, we have Luke Haganars. Did I pronounce that right, Dr. Haganars? You did that very, yeah. very well. So yeah. let me tell you a little bit about him, just so you know. Uh, he's uh, he's considers himself a policy wonk and an academic, and he certainly is. Um, he uh, did his PhD at Redbound University in uh uh, and then he did his master's in global health. He's focused on uh, obesity. And he recently did a, uh, he went with a grant, a pretty prestigious grant to UCSF to study some of uh, the social determinants of obesity and some interesting projects that I got to see firsthand at Obesity Week. And currently he's an assistant professor at Amsterdam University and it was just nice to meet you. And it's nice to have you here. You're taking your Friday night and spending it here. So I want to thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, one of the things I was talking about off air before we sort of like hit the record button was, uh, you know, was the story. And I, and I would, would love it if you could tell the listeners a little bit about it of just growing up in your hometown. And you got to see industry sort of work firsthand. And I just loved that story. It, it left such an impact on me. I mean, even now, months later, it still left an impact on me. Do you mind telling that story? Sure. Um, I must uh, admit that it's, it's, it's sort of a story that I uh, invented uh, a couple of years after I already moved from the town where I grew up. Um, but I actually do think it, it sort of explains my interest in what's now being called in, uh, in, in research, the commercial determinants of health. So the systems, practices, and pathways uh, through which commercial actors impact health and equity are, in lay terms, it's often about research that uh, talks about how the tobacco industry, the ultra-processed food industry, the alcohol industry, the chemical industry, um, how they lobby our government and how they influence our public opinion. Um, and I grew up in this town called uh, bergen op -Zoom. It's a um, small-sized town, about 60,000 inhabitants, I think, uh, just north of Antwerp, just across the Belgian border, border in the Netherlands. Um, and like everyone in the Netherlands that ever goes to vacation in France, which is what most people do, uh, they pass the town and then they pass like this massive Philip Morris factory that's like uh, on the outskirts of that town. Uh, and it even has like a sort of... Uh, um, big turn in the in the highway that sort of makes you uh, sort of pass uh, all around the big black uh, red factory uh, that stands from Philip Morris. Um, and back in the day, I was uh, very much into cycling. So I did a lot of, uh, you know, bike rides uh, where I passed the factory. Um, uh, and I was always just thinking like, you know, this is a factory that employs a lot of people. Uh, it uh, also caters for a lot of very working class uh, jobs that, uh, you know, these people can make a living off, off of. And at the same time, you know, they, they employ these people for producing uh, cancerous products. Um, so I guess it kind of hit my interest, even though I wasn't that aware of it actually hitting my interest for studying health sciences uh, somewhere else in the Netherlands. Uh, where I then, you know, started learning all about social determinants of health, commercial determinants of health, a bit less, but most definitely the whole notion that uh, one's health is not something that you can just take for granted, that there is these sort of larger systems at play that actually impact our, our health. 
um, including, you know, commercial determined development, including uh, the whole idea that there is an industry who uh, profits off of our sick, off of our diseases. Um, and that whole factory in that town, I guess, uh, uh, quite vividly uh, exemplifies that. Um, and I guess one thing that also made me notice how hard it actually can be to tackle these problems is that when I sort of graduated, I remember uh, there being a big discussion about whether this factory might close shop uh, for you know relocating its business to Indonesia or whatever. I'm not sure exactly what the uh, discussion was about again. Um, and there was this debate in the Netherlands about, you know, in a way we want these factories to close shop, right? We don't want to, uh, you know, why would we allow these companies to make their products that are killing us? Uh, and at the same time, actually closing such a factory will, you know, destroy a ton of jobs in that city that, where I was from. Um, so can you imagine how hard it can be for, um, a local council member, a politician, um, someone who wants to, you know, help people out in these towns uh, to deal with such a dilemma, and um, which I guess goes to show that, um, you know, there's these 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 bigger systems at play that impact our health, and uh, tackling these can be a very hard undertaking, and sort of understanding the politics off of it. I think is important, and that's uh, why I'm uh, studying uh, exactly these things now as an assistant professor. So, you know, I'm just wondering, like, uh, clearly you had some interest in politics, public policy. You're a cycler, so you're interested in health and performance. I mean, you know, how yeah. do you reconcile the fact, like, uh, you know, how do you view that Philip Morris factory where you grew up? Like, you know, all of your friends are, or or maybe their families are, you know, that is their bread and butter. What would they do without that? And uh, and yet, mm -hmm. you know, it seems to be such a huge problem, right? Um, in terms of public health, and you know, there's there's sort of like a whole bunch of you know thoughts that come to mind. You know, you could easily sort of say, well, it's the people's choice. Right, whether to smoke or not, and and you know they're provide they're being provided a product, and mm -hmm. you know that may legitimize it. You could say, well, it's um, look at how many people in the town are are benefiting it, are sort of getting this benefit, you know, and you can legitimize yeah. it. How you yeah. know how do you reconcile all this back then, and does this in any way impact sort of your desire to pursue this field? I mean, I'm just wondering how you sure. become that person that's studying the sort of corporate influence on public policy as it relates to health. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought up um, uh, sort of my history as a cycler, because I remember when I was very much uh, engaged in, you know, wanting to become a professional cyclist that uh, most professional sportsmen, they've got this very sort of individualist notion of what drives one behavior of what drives one's um, lifestyle uh, and also therefore they can be quite uh, harsh on folks that have a bad health lifestyle for various reasons because they have this notion in their minds that it's just about perseverance discipline all that jazz um, I sort of you know encountered these ideas of, of my friends of my my colleagues in cycling, whilst also being a student in health sciences, where we, you know, we're, we're taught that it's actually about more things than just one's individual choices and one's individual desires or whatever. So that always, you know, I was always stuck in you this that? dilemma. Hold on, I'm sorry, I want to focus on this. How were you taught that? Because all of medicine yeah. blames the patient, in my opinion. So how, mm -hmm. how was that taught to you? Because we certainly don't have that in the United States. You well, know? I guess there's a difference here between medicine and public health, right? So if, if you study to become a public health doctor, I reckon even in the US, you'd get a bit more of an idea uh, being told that it's you know not just about the individual. Um, and I didn't study medicine in a way, fortunately. I study health sciences. Uh, and then as a master's global health, which is even more about, you know, the grand picture that uh, 
uh, you know, talks about, you know, how globalization affects uh, uh, the trade of American uh, multinational food companies in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and therefore, these countries also are getting addicted to uh, ultra-processed food. So, you know, I think I've never really been um, immersed into a field where almost everyone only talks about these diseases as persons, their individual choices or their 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 individual problem. Um, but like I said, at the same time, I was also in a social context where everyone did <laughs> talk about these problems as one's own damn fault. Um, so I guess that did sort of drive my interest in this, this notion that there is sort of a niche in academia, which is called public health, that talks about these problems, that societal problems. And then there's grand society that doesn't do that at all. And like you say, just perceives uh, these products as stuff that we want and these companies as mere providers of them. Um, and um, actually, very recently, more or less, mostly since I've, I've done the fellowship at UCSF and now being a, a, an assistant professor, I've started learning um, from the literature that actually unpacks uh, um, the behavior of corporations to exactly fuel that idea that it is an individual's desire to smoke or to eat crap food or whatever. Uh, even though I guess uh, you know better than many others that it's it's not that simple at all. Um, so, yes. so can you talk about you know? Uh, so clearly you're you're motivated to understand the space and sort of have an impact. I'm surprised and actually pleasantly surprised that, you know, you're given sort of that empathy that it takes more, much more complicated than, you know, eat less and move more, or it's much more complicated than smoke less and, you know, learn about lung cancer. Sure. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, that, that, that gives me some, some, some hope and I need hope, but so walk me through, you had two very interesting projects that you've worked on recently that we had talked about do you mind sort of discussing them? Because I thought that both of them were telling in a way. Sure. I guess there were three because I had uh, two poster presentations and one uh, oral presentation at Obesity Week. Um, Talk about uh, the one maybe... that impacted you the most. How about that? You know, the one that you found yeah. most insight from. Sure. Yeah, I guess that would be a, a study that's uh, actually going to be published in a couple of weeks from now, I think, which is a study where we uh, unpacked uh, the systems that explain why we're stuck with obesity prevention, uh, how we might get unstuck, and how we might remain unstuck. Uh, and that sounds pretty grand, and it actually kind of is. Um, but we managed to kind of crack the code uh, by uh, combining what's called system thinking, uh, uh, as well as uh, a theory from the political sciences, uh, which is called the punctuated equilibrium theory. Uh, and the letter basically talks about policy. You're going to have to explain yeah. both of those, by the way, because, you know, people don't yeah. understand what those are. So you're going to have to explain True. both of those. I'll do my best to try and explain these things as easy as possible. And that's actually another notion to this paper, because it took us months to sort of unpack the jargon in the systems thinking world, the complexity sciences world, whatever you want to call it, the jargon of the political scientists and the public health or medicine jargon and to combine it into a package that actually folks can 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 read. Um, so I guess uh, starting from the beginning, uh, what is punctuated equilibrium theory? It's a theory from the political sciences that tries to understand why it is that policy uh, often seems to be stagnant. You know, there's these very prolonged period of time when there's basically nothing actually changing or nothing changing as much. And then boom, all of a sudden you get this massive change in a certain policy direction. Just to give you one example, um, uh, Germany had the Energiewende about 10 years ago uh, after like prolonged sort of increased resistance towards nuclear. Uh, Fukushima happened and then Angela Merkel was like, okay, we're not just gonna stop with uh, uh, you know building nuclear plants. And then that was the new sort of equilibrium uh, in that field. Um, and the whole idea of the theory is that it's sort of a policy is always about the fight for attention, right? 
it's only a very limited amount of time that uh, the political agenda has. Uh, so you they can't like deal with all problems at the same time, uh, meaning that many problems are sort of just being uh, neglected. Um, and system thinking, um, it's uh, in a way a kind of a philosophy that uh, uh, helps us understand not just how A might relate to B, but also my how B might actually also relate back to E, to A, and how there's many other factors involved that actually uh, uh, explain uh, how a system at large works. And in a sense, that comes down to the notion that uh, the, more, the, um, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Uh, and the sort of mega metaphor that everyone always uses in the field is the swarm of uh, sparrows, um, where the individual behavior of a single sparrow uh, is part of a much larger group. And if you look at the swarm of sparrows move up and down in the world, in the sky, they create these incredible patterns that can't be explained just by the behavior of an individual sparrow uh, and its direct interaction with others. Um, Methodologically speaking, uh, what systems thinkers do is build models, build maps of a system that they're interested in, that they're engaging in. And when there's numbers, they can actually use those maps to model scenarios. And uh, the best known example of the letter would be, you know, these prediction models that are being used to, uh, you know, help us see how climate change uh, uh, is happening. Um, I didn't have numbers to uh, model uh, why we're stuck with obesity prevention how, and how to get unstuck, but we could use the system mapping technique uh, to better understand uh, the system of obesity policy making. And um, uh, the three models that we built, one of them was about uh, why we're stuck, one of them was about how to get unstuck, and one of them is about how to remain unstuck. And I think the, the first one, how, why we're stuck, is most robust, uh, which makes sense because, you know, we are kind of stuck, especially in the US. So there's most data about, uh, 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 you know, uh, there's most studies, they talk about why we're stuck because you know, in most cases we are stuck. And uh, the, the map um, basically comes down to defining that um, society uh, has this image of obesity as your own problem as your own fault, as your own laziness, as your own gluttony. Uh, that's not my opinion. That's just, you know, the uh, image that we have in society, unfortunately. That then uh, trickles down into the policymaking system uh, by creating uh, a kind of friction in politicians to deal with it because, you know, they don't deal with it as being a public policy problem. They think it's an individual's problem. So why would they pay serious attention to it if there's all these other problems that need to be fixed? Um, similarly, policymaking institutions, uh, you know, it's also not that high on their agenda. Uh, so what happens is that they don't produce the policies that might actually contribute to preventing obesity from uh, developing in the first place, you know, tackling the ultra processed food industry most primarily, but policies that are implemented are mostly about um, uh, health education and telling people that they just need to lose weight uh, and uh, lifestyle interventions that um, don't always work. Uh, I think you're an exception to the rule, but uh, uh, you know, for many, it's just a, a business about offering these weight loss interventions that. Uh, don't always work and almost never work long term. Um, that policy focus on the individual, you know, having the individual be more disciplined, then caters uh, to an even stronger framing of obesity as your own fault. It also caters for a stronger uh, problem ownership of the uh, issue by the biomedical weight loss industry. And I think uh, we uh, uh, saw that with our own eyes at Obesity Week. Um, who then uh, are even more uh, powerful in terms of framing the problem as an individual problem. Um, I didn't tell you this. <clears throat> the One of the head uh, nutritionists from Coca-Cola came to me at Obesity Week and 
asked why I was critical of them. And they said, we're trying to help. We can do great research. We can help you get great research done. Yeah. We want to do sure. good science. They said, we want to do good science. And I believed the person that said it to me. I don't think she was lying. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and they said, well, we have uh, non-caloric options. We, you know, we have a full line of water, a full line mm -hmm. of seltzer, a full line of, you know, non-caloric options. And uh, I just, I never told you that we're talking about industry, but what a fascinating way of framing this, right? If you look sure. at, when you came up with this systems approach to how we are stuck, what do you, so the biggest thing that you found was blaming the individuals, probably one of those things. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, we kind of know that already, right? That's not a new finding, but yeah. the new the novelty of this study is that it's perpetuating itself. It's the reinforcing feedback loop with uh, the framing itself, uh, causing this policy inertia uh, that makes policy makers continuously uh, point the needle towards uh, policies that actually perpetuate the image of obesity at one's own fault. And who That's do you think- a novel finding. Who do you think benefits from that? Um, because, I mean, for me, it's like these things don't happen for no reason, right? Um, so there's... So... Well, it obviously is the uh, food processing industry and the weight loss industry. That 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 seems most clear. And now um, the companies, right? And the pharmaceutical companies, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I would so, group them how... under the weight loss industry. And I must say that, like, they're not all bad. It's very yeah. easy to sort of um, assign moral agency to these actors and say, you're wrong, you're bad, you should not do this. But at the same time, it's their businesses, right? So it's their job to make money. Um, and um, it's it's sort of taking our eyes off the ball by uh, pointing to their lack of morality or whatever you want to call it. Well, in fact, it's kind of their job to make money and it's more the job of civil society and the government to try and better uh, regulate them so that they can actually make money off of things that don't kill us. <laughs> That's, I yeah. think, the sort of uh, $12.7 trillion that we're dealing with. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. You know, I, I don't, I agree with you. Uh, I don't think, I mean, Coca-Cola makes products that my patients use. Uh, I mm -hmm. think, in fact, my office just bought Bubbly Seltzer, which is a Coca-Cola yeah. product. And, and uh, you know, I I don't assign any moral, you know, and that, that nutritionist who came to me and said, you know, we can do great research. We can help you. You know, we want to do good science. I believe she was a good person. You sure. Know? And yeah. I believe that. Yeah, I mean, that what's even worse probably than like assigning moral agency to multinational food companies is blaming the individuals that work there because yeah. you know they're just doing their job. Uh, you got to think about this in a systems way. And when you think about it in a systems way, automatically you sort of are not that interested in <laughs> the individuals that are part of the system, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and yet at the same time, it's those individuals you know who make that system function, right? If True. five... 50,000 yeah. individuals got up and said, we demand, you know, yeah. Coca-Cola remove sugar, all the employees, what would happen the next day? Yeah. And that's yeah. actually a good bridge to the second map in the model or in the study, <laughs> which is about how to get unstuck. Uh, that's a bigger one because there's many more moving parts that actually play a role in sort of changing the paradigm about how we think about obesity. Um, but according to the theory and actually also the literature where folks investigated uh, changes in policymaking around obesity, it often involves what's called a focusing event. Uh, so it's this one-off sort of uh, unexpected event that suddenly focuses attention of a political system, of a media system uh, on a certain topic um, and uh, just I guess three examples that are interesting in this context. Um, COVID-19, obviously, I'm not sure how big that discussion was in, in the US, but definitely in the Netherlands at some point in time, 
the idea that there were so many people with metabolic obesity related diseases in hospital beds with uh, you know massive COVID infections um, actually created quite some attention towards the idea that COVID is actually or obesity is actually an issue uh, that d doesn't only affect individuals but in that sense also society at large um, but because at that moment and probably still uh, the idea that obesity was your own fault was still so dominant that that actually catered for a kind of you know narrative that it's because of folks that are obese we're still in a lockdown because they are uh, you know occupying uh, the IC units yeah uh, what, there's actually been what they did in the United States was they gave uh, free Krispy Kreme donuts they also gave free french fries and Walmart okay. free soda for people who got uh, uh, the food, uh, the vaccinated. Shop. Yeah, yeah, that's that's ah. what they did in the United States. Yeah, yeah, but but there's actually been some research suggesting that the this exact sort of narrative of folks with obesity uh, blocking uh, oh, the IC unit. Yeah, they, uh, the that, narrative. That actually, yeah, the narrative in the states was more those people who decided not to get back. The unvaccinated was a big, you know, a big thing. Uh, oh yeah, you know, yeah. or people who didn't want to wear masks, they're cavalier, or people who chose not to get vaccinated. That so, but yeah, there w certainly was a, you know, yeah. hey guys, you know, metabolic health is a huge risk factor. Hyperglycemia yeah. is a huge risk factor. Certainly was that, but I don't think I ever saw the shaming of those people, at least in the united states you know uh, uh context like the the social media and news news context mm. i think most of the uh social pressure came in the form of uh, getting vaccinated you could see that with the job loss that happened they you know uh government workers who didn't get vaccinated were fired nobody nobody fired you know somebody with obesity i, I don't think no but, yeah, yeah but yeah. the the social yeah, pressure I mean, it, it came wasn't in that form true. yeah yeah no, that's recognizable. The uh, whole debate about vaccines and mandates or whatever, obviously, was much more fierce also in Europe, also in the Netherlands. Um, but coming back to obesity and metabolic diseases, um, there's been some studies definitely showing that the enhanced attention of the importance of metabolic health actually increased weight stigma in the UK, in the US, in Canada. And I don't think there's any research specifically to the Netherlands, but yeah, I would be very surprised if that didn't happen also. And that makes sense because if there is a focusing event like that and there's still this very strong idea that it's your own fault, then the increased attention for the problem in the media and the political uh, system would just you know, strengthen that existing uh, uh, narrative. Um, I guess the second example that I always like to give is that we've got this soccer player, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, who shoved a can of Coke uh, from his uh, sort of a press conference desk, I don't know, five years ago. That also catered for quite some attention to the issue. Um, uh, and just one very small example, uh, over in the Netherlands since like about a year, I think there's like a free lunch or breakfast for kids in neighborhoods that are pretty poor um, because of the fact that uh, uh, um, at some point a kid uh, you know dropped down uh, he didn't die but he fainted uh, because he had nothing to eat before he went to school and that short story then generated a lot of media attention and then the, the politicians started acting and actually got something together um, so I guess the sort of moral of this story is that when you want to uh, move towards a political system that is more interested in tackling the obesogenic environment uh, rather than, you know, telling individuals uh, to uh, uh, adopt a better lifestyle, uh, you're going to have to take stock of these one-off windows of opportunity uh, in order to reframe the policy problem from an individual's problem to a societal problem. Um, and uh, we think that that is much easier if we build better relationships with the affected communities, you know, not just the professional societies that um, 
uh, offer uh, obesity treatment, but actually uh, the anti-waste stigma community, the food justice environment, uh, uh, you know, activists, um, uh, those communities that are actually able to bring the sort of evidence alive, which I think is something that you do every single day uh, when you work with your patients. Um, yeah, the, can we can we talk about that? Because, um, you know, I, I I've interacted a lot in the United States. We call that uh, that movement health at every size movement. And so so I am in 100 percent agreement that weight stigma is an incredible negative influence on our society. Incredibly sure. negative. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. The amount of. Uh, self-blame, shame and guilt, you know, these emotions are like, you know, palpable for anybody with, you know, who's had a weight issue. And uh, and nobody deserves to be humiliated, treated poorly, right, because of their weight. Um, and with any sort of movement, there's like sort of the, the, the good parts and then there's the bad parts. And what I've noticed with the bad, sort of the bad parts with any movement is you know, this sort of normalization of pathology that that I wonder, you know, how do we reconcile this? I've, for my entire career, as long as I've interacted with this health at every size movement, I thought that these yeah. are the perfect allies. They're the perfect allies. It's like yeah. the people who need the most help, the people who are tired of being disenfranchised, tired of being sold a BS, you know, you know, uh, uh, online, you know, energy uh, balance, uh, you know, garbage narrative, right? You know, and uh, or they've been given a, you know, personal trainer who told them to eat more and move less or, or eat less and move more, you know, sorry, or, or uh, you know, they bought some get quick fix scheme or go low or whatever it is, an infomercial that says do this or do that. You know, yeah. they're victims, right? And so, Somebody who sort of brings that to the forefront, hey, you don't need that stigma, you need self-love, you're not a victim, we could, you know, I love that and I want to ally with that. The problem I have is this is a severe problem at the same time, right, that deserves mm -hmm. sort of medical attention. And so yeah. I, to me, it seems like now if I'm a systems thinker, and I'm not, or I'm a politician, it's like, how do I evangelize this? To end, we need to end stigma, weight stigma, to address weight. I yeah. mean, I'm I'm guessing ending weight stigma is on your things that we need to do. Sure. <laughs> was it on? Was that on the list of things that keep us unstuck? Um, uh, they keep us stuck. Oh, for sure. Or, um, oh no. So keep us unstuck. It, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because you're talking about, uh, yeah, you know, meaningfully engaging communities that are actually feeling the burden of the problem. Yeah, and then- so For sure, yeah. And I guess meaningfully engaging them, I guess that's the key word, because meaningfully then would be understanding them, right? right. So empathy, yeah. and then giving them mm -hmm. something, right? True. Uh, yeah. Insight. Uh, but anyway, tell me more, how do we get the world unstuck? This is what I'm waiting to hear. I want to hear what the brightest thinkers are thinking. How do we get the world- uh, Yeah unstuck from obesity and then keep them unstuck you know if you can just drill down those things yeah so again like coming back to the theory it all comes down to sort of the sequentiality of uh, taking stock off of a focusing event that temporarily uh, you know focuses political attention on a problem like this in terms of reframing the problem from an individual problem to a societal problem and in order to do that you're gonna have to collaborate not with the folks that are actually making us stuck that are actually keeping us stuck so the weight loss industry and the uh, food processing industry and our pharmaceutical industry but you gotta be cooperating with those that are actually uh, you know feeling every single day what this problem means for them our society kind of abuses them um and um, that's a hard one because they don't necessarily speak the same language as, as your, uh, uh, you know, your regular public health person does because they want to normalize obesity. That's sort of the narrative, right? So there is a kind of a dialectical struggle between these two groups. And I don't have the answer how we should get that together. But 
I do know that when we do, we're going to be much uh, more nimble, uh, much more responsive in terms of uh, taking stock off of these one-off windows of opportunity uh, that can help um, you know, create these punctuations in the political system. So it um, sounds like a grassroots, you know, we need yeah. a grassroots effort. Is that, that am I summarizing it correctly? Yeah, that's exactly the, the terminology that we use in the paper. Um, and uh, if I can look up the paper for one minute, I oh, can we'll actually put it, go to the specific yeah. wording that we use. We'll put it in the show notes. So guys, if you're listening and you're here and you're like, I want to see this paper, you know, you can find it in the jo in the show notes and we'll link it. We'll link it so it's easily sure. accessible. Yeah, it will take, I think, like a month or so before it gets published. Um, this will be out. In, this will be out by then. So, so right, right around this, we'll we'll wait until you it's published, and then we'll put yeah. this out, Luke. Awesome. Uh, let me show because I guess the the whole uh, struggle of of this topic is that you need to pick your words so carefully. Uh, <laughs> so you want to share the screen? Yeah. I don't, I don't know about well, share the screen, but um, uh, that's let me fine. Just go back because we really took a lot of time to, you know, pick our words carefully in the paper because it's know, a sensitive topic. And, can I um, can I uh, can I highlight around this? So, if the uh, if the pro if the issue here is is, you know, the individual and collecting individuals against several multinational corporations, are there any yeah. like? Um, <laughs> Are there any success stories in that department? You know, because yeah. I, I mean, in like sort of political science history or, or uh, you know, can you help me understand um, success stories fighting the food industry, the pharmaceutical industry, mo most doctors, right? And uh, mm -hmm. who else was in that axis of evil that we, we weren't calling evil? <laughs> Sorry. The, uh, um, so I, I guess... Uh, like has anybody example, won you know has anybody won with a social movement has anybody won yeah sure well i guess uh the trans fat uh, we won on the trans fat um that's one of them that's uh, something that science actually played a pretty good role in uh that but, uh i, I won't were, ever you know yeah but they were able to shift even you know to brum it it was like just last week, they started stopped brominated oil. So what they did was they brominated oils, and they used like the cheapest quality oxidized vegetable oils. So it wasn't like a hard thing for them no. to do, you know. That was so, relatively easy. That's true. Yeah, yeah. But any like, well, I, I must say, like in 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 essence, the story around uh, sugar sweetened beverages, we're kind of winning there, right? I mean, we're still not there, but uh, the sales volumes of the sugar sweetened beverages they are going down. But that's energy drinks thing. are going up, right? So, yeah, like, yeah, where, yeah, that's where... that's the problem with with <laughs> with these companies. Um, I remember when we were in uh, DC for one of the uh, Hawkins Fellowship um, seminars. Uh, there were all these policy wongs doing, uh, uh, you know, their talks and whatever. And what actually came up quite a lot is that uh, American folks working in the policy arena that they very much agree and acknowledge that. Uh, them working in a capitalist system makes them really understand that capitalism always follows the path of least resistance. So that's true. When you uh, knock out trans fats, something else will probably pop back in. When you knock out sugar cream beverages, like you're saying, uh, you see the. Well, the, you look at uh, you look at coffee. It's a never ending story. You know, the coffee sales have gone up, and I'm talking about sugary coffee drinks have gone up exponentially. Uh, the yeah. number of energy drinks has gone up exponentially. Um, yeah. So it's it's like uh, it, it and you know all the you know all of the industry has played into this. You know. Um, um, so it. So I. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, I I um, I guess to summarize, I don't have the answer to this very hard question. Yeah. I think no one does. I don't think anyone who calls themselves a commercial feminist health researcher really knows. Uh, and I think it has all to do with the innovativeness and the scale of these companies. Can we, you know, uh, is there any model to follow though? I'm just curious, you know, because I don't know policy. That's yeah. why I'm asking. Is there any model to follow, you know, uh, yeah. like a social well, justice movement that, that sure. has yeah. changed industry significantly? 
Yeah, well, uh, coming back to the system map, um, uh, the notion of grassroots movements, uh, uh, um, sort of exposing industry and uh, uh, demanding government to better regulate it, that has happened before. Uh, your, your sugar sweetened beverages that are around in many US cities, they've mostly been adopted after some vigilant uh, grassroots activism uh, you know, to demand these taxes. <laughs> Can you imagine American civilians demanding new taxes from the government? Uh, I must admit it's mostly Democrat cities that did this and mostly very liberal governments that did this, but um, it did happen. Um, another example I always like to give, although it's not necessarily true that that whole problem has been fixed, but it has at least been targeted is the uh, targeting of the tobacco industry of uh, black Americans with uh, menthol cigarettes. Uh, that's something that sort of got the black Afri black American community riled up in a kind of a productive way in terms of demanding the government to step in. Um, uh, another example, I guess, over here, uh, probably also in the US, vaping is a big thing. So, you know, uh, combustible cigarettes are going down. Uh, so the industry innovates and now they've got vapes to addict our kids to. Um, they're faster than our policymaking institutions because policymaking institutions, they're slow because of all the checks and balances that are uh, involved in uh, you know, drafting new legislation. But at least there's, there's like this public anger that the government, that, that the tobacco industry now uh, targets kids again with these, with these vapes. So at some point in time, uh, they will have stronger legislation to to try and bend that curve again. But the whole, I guess, once once I'm talking about this right now, it's kind of like this um, chasing a, uh, how do you say? Um, the, the government is just always too slow because the industry is just too innovative and has too much power. That's the problem. Yeah. I mean, even with vaping, I saw like uh, the FDA came down on vaping and then you know, this just sort of like overseas vaping, which which is probably even worse, you know, very high temperature vaping causing certain aldehydes to form in the in the gases, which are even worse than the original versions. Uh, wow. You know, so like technically they were trying to do a good thing to regulate this industry. And then it just let the even worse players win. Um, yeah. You know, but so but what I'm hearing is the way out is social anger which makes me very happy because I've been angry yeah. for a long time. You know, the quickest way to, yeah. is mob social anger. You know, uh, you talked about that event in uh, the Netherlands where the kid fainted, you know, so we need to engineer social anger. That seems like yeah. the easiest way to win. I guess so. I mean, not to, not to go into too big depth in terms of, uh, sociological theory, but um, uh, Marx and Gramsci, they talk about this false consciousness. So the idea that uh, the poor, the working class, uh, actually believe that they're destined to be poor and working class, uh, because that's just how the social order has to look like. <laughs> and uh, I, I often like to think about this as, as similar to what we're dealing with with these industries. You know, we, we would think of government intervening in these industries and these these markets as paternalistic because uh, you know we we buy this stuff uh, because we want it and these companies are just making them because we want it so you know just stay out of it government um, uh, and that's obviously also a sort of myth that's been manufactured quite successfully by many of these industries um, and uh I mean, on a bad day, I like to call it the Stockholm syndrome that we're in. Kind of stuck, yeah. But I like your, yeah. I like the solution of we need to, uh, we need to, you know, a grassroots effort that relies on social yeah. anger to promote social justice. I'm a, I'm a big bill. I can get behind that. Can you talk a little sure. bit about any major things from that paper? And I think your other project was really inspiring. So maybe we could quickly cover that one too. Yeah. So I did. Two other papers at the Busy Week. Uh, one of them was about, uh, actually two of them, both of them are case studies on how commercial determinants of health function in, in real world settings. Um, so uh, I think you attended 
uh, my talk on the healthy checkout ordinances that Berkeley and Paris uh, primed in the US. Berkeley and Paris in California to local governments. And it's basically about um, uh, uh, in adopting nutritional standards at checkout so that you don't impulse buy, uh, you know, a Snickers or a soda or whatever when you're uh, checking out your groceries. That's what, what they're trying to do. Um, and um, uh, what's kind of inspiring about both cities is that they were actually grassroots movements that made these uh, local governments uh, pursue that policy. Uh, you know, it was all kinds of local grassroots groups that represented, you know, black families, young people, Latinos, whatever, um, uh, to sort of, you know, take back some control of their food environment um, uh, uh, and to be protected from impulse buying, stuff they actually don't want. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I like that. I really liked uh, how things went on there. Um, the paper is not ready yet, uh, so I can't uh, direct your audience to, to it yet because it's still taking some time to fine tune the exact message that we want to bring across. But that was an interesting sort of, uh, I guess, optimistic story that I brought back home with me uh, after my year in the US. Um, yeah. and, and did it result, so did it, you know, did it culminate? So you're working with this community. They're, you know, having community meetings. They're they're talking about making a healthier checkout. Like they're trying to yeah. regulate a healthier checkout, which I'd imagine would be a really, you know, tough thing to do. And people don't realize. I think you told me that these companies yeah, pay a really... lot of money to be in your face when you walk in and in your face when True. you leave. Right. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about that? Because people don't realize that they're under attack. Somebody is literally trying yeah. to engineer them to make a bad choice. And I don't think many people know how deep that rabbit hole goes. True. No, it's I mean, it's very it's the most valuable real estate in a grocery store. Right. The checkout aisle, because everyone needs to pass it unless you want to steal your, your groceries or whatever. Uh, and often you gotta like wait in line there. And uh, the sort of story that I kept hearing from everyone that I interviewed for this study, it was a qualitative study. They, they always talked about uh, kids, you know, when you're standing in line to check out uh, your, uh, with your groceries after a long day of work, you're tired and you've got your, your toddler around and they've got this Snickers and candy bars and whatever at their eye level. Sometimes you gotta give in because you know you 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 gotta deal with <laughs> the reality of, of raising toddlers, right? And just taking the sort of temptation out by not having uh, the junk food there, to me it makes a lot of sense. And actually, like you're saying, when folks started realizing that it's it's actually something that industry does very uh, explicitly because they know that people will buy impulse, uh, 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 you know. Uh, things over there, um, you know, in a way that can be a kind of empowering knowledge to possess uh, and to sort of start uh, advocating or lobbying your own personal, your own uh, council members in your city to, to, to pursue such a policy. And um, is there a bounce? Is there like a, you know, I always like to allude to movies. I'm a Star Wars guy. The Empire Strikes Back, you know, uh, Marco yeah. Guzella, Marco Guzella who we've had here on this podcast uh, is a personal hero of mine. You know, about seven or eight years ago when I was first on my own health journey, I reached out to him and you may not know who he is. He's a physician, uh, but he worked with West Virginia University to make sure that they go sugar free. Uh, and he, you know, when I saw him lecture on this, I cold called him and I said, you know, tell me, tell me what you did. I want to learn. I want to know how did you make this happen? And uh, talk about engineering social change. You know, he worked with his hospital. He worked with the CEO. He had to look at contracts between the hospital and corporate uh, accounts. He and the corporations fought it. And ultimately, they got it. They got, they went sugar free. It was a big deal, nice. you know? Yeah. They had water, they had, you know, if they were post-operative and they really had hypoglycemia, of course they could have it, but, you know, yeah. otherwise the default was sugar-free. There was nothing sold. You could bring it yeah. in, but yeah. nothing would be sold. 
And then recently, it, they reversed it all. They reversed huh. everything a year, a year ago or so. And he, and he was called me. He was so disheartened. He's like, try, spent so much time. Yeah. And they would post, put up posters saying, welcome back, sugar. Or like, you know, sugar's back now. Like, you know, you can't take the. Wow. And it was like evangelized that it's, and it was a corporate influence. The uh, people there, uh, they, some of the, the, you know, I guess some of the staff there and ultimately his leadership as he left that institution, you know, um, it wasn't able. So did with this that issue sucks. at Berkeley, uh, it does suck. But now you're in Berkeley, you're in Paris, you're looking at this. How did, was there any, was the empire striking back? Oh, for sure. Um, I mean, this is still very new, but um, uh, the I think I think I did the interviews with the folks involved in the policy making process in the spring of this year, um, but then in the summer, especially in Paris, when it was formally uh, already implemented, July first, um, the local government started getting all these letters from uh, cities, uh, from uh, from grocery stores, saying that they were. Uh, uh, not happy with the policy because it might, you know, uh, make them lose a lot of revenue. That it might cost them jobs. Um, that it uh, that they were very afraid that it would just mean that they couldn't sell any soda or any candy anymore. And apparently, that whole uh, opposition was orchestrated by the California Grocers Association, uh, who reached out to the store owners to try and oppose them and sort of um, uh, mis or disinform them with. Uh, all these ideas that it may actually be much more than just the healthy checkout uh, ordinance. Um, and that did cause a big backlash because Paris is a working class community. Uh, they don't want to lose businesses over there, which makes total sense. Uh, and when you're a council member, you got to take those concerns seriously. So they did water down their ordinance quite significantly. Uh, and whether or not they will be effective in terms of improving uh, diets. I don't know. Uh, the policy will be implemented there January 1st. Uh, it will be evaluated properly uh, by my colleague, uh, Jen Felby at UC Davis. Um, but there was some blowback that they got there. Uh, that's for sure. So the uh, anticipating industry orchestrated blowback through these policies is something that anyone interested in pursuing one does need to do and i guess the lessons that we're drawing at this moment while we're analyzing that data is that you need to be be as clear as possible in terms of what's sort of the non-negotiable about the specific language of the healthy checkout ordinance you know which stores uh, how much feed from the register which specific um, uh, foods can still be sold which can't still be sold all that the nitty-gritty it's really important because if you don't, you're going to end up in a very sort of uh, confusing uh, narrative around uh, demarcating uh, uh, products that can and can't be sold, uh, which can be very hard, uh, you know, to try and get the policy across the finish line. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think people understand, you know, I was surprised when I called Mark up and he said, you know, this took me years. And I was like, oh, I could do this in the Yale system in a couple months, you know, at the time, you know, like a, a couple meetings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Through. It's like, no, 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 it took years. And unfortunately, it didn't even last. Yeah. Do you know how, why, why it was? Uh, I don't know. It's not in the depth that, that uh, you would want me to. I wish I knew more, but yeah. I don't, I don't know exactly. I'm sure there's, it's always a vision and leadership issue when things fall apart like that, I'd imagine. Sure. Yeah. So what's the next steps for you? I guess now you're, uh, you know, you're an assistant professor at Amsterdam University. What do you end up, yeah. you know, what is your, what is your research focus now, I guess? Or do you have a research project you're working on now? Yeah, I, I like to call my niche the commercial determinants of metabolic health. Uh, I think that sums up best what I, what I do. Um, and it's, it's still the combination of, uh, uh, studying public health problems, mostly metabolic health issues, whatnot, uh, combining uh, systems mapping with uh, political science, uh, the applied political science theory, um, 
And uh, I like doing case studies. So the one on the healthy checkout ordinance is, is the one study that I presented at Obesity Week. I also did the poster on the foreign rights that you may remember. So the, the contracts that Coke or Pepsi have with public universities in the US uh, and how uh, that has created this kind of system where uh, the middle managers at the university sort of speak as being representative of the beverage companies, which was an interesting uh, thing. Um, but uh, I'll be doing similar types of policies, but now uh, a bit more in the Netherlands. So, you know, I got uh, two interns uh, next year who will be looking at the beer contracts of fraternities in the Netherlands and, uh, you know, Heineken. Uh, which is very similar to these American contracts with volume incentives, prestige, you know, wanting to partner with Heineken. Uh, I've also, uh, I will also be have, uh, you know, supervising an intern who will be looking into the, um, uh, the partnership that McDonald's has with public libraries in the Netherlands. Oh my uh, which God, is all you about... gotta be kidding. I'm not kidding. It's about, uh, you know, the Netherlands... Uh, uh, sort of literacy levels are plummeting. It's it's no joke. It's really not going well. The literacy of uh, you know fifteen years old is, is is really going down quite quite severely. So that's a massive problem. And uh, uh, you know apparently there's uh, there's been reason for a partnership between McDonald's uh, during like a week where reading is celebrated in the Netherlands, where folks that uh, buy a Happy Meal, get like a little book in the Happy Meal. Oh uh, and the uh, and, uh, McDonald's also like sponsored like reading events in public libraries where uh, a McDonald's sponsored uh, child book author reads uh, their book. Uh, and obviously it's woke washing. I'd like to call it woke washing. Um, and uh, again, I, I'm not necessarily like trying to morally denigrate that partnership. But from a scientific point of view, I'm interested in how such a partnership is being justified, how um, it developed, how it got there. Because uh, if we better understand how these things are being conceptualized, how they are being uh, operationalized, we can also try and better understand how we can, you know, make society aware that this is actually not a very good partnership. Uh, if we want to take uh, our health and also our literacy level seriously at the same time. Uh, these types of things. Um, same thing happened with other... the vaccination. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's a, this desire to do a social engineering and you have the mayor of New York City eating French fries and saying, you know, go get your free fast food after you get, yeah. or Krispy Kreme giving donuts. Uh, you know, it, it. I don't think as a society we've really yet come together and said, you know, that these food, like, if you look at us as a society, we've always celebrated food. We come to, we hunt us, you know, we're, we're community hunters where we, we, you know, share food, right? We, we, important things would happen over food, right? And so now, you know, I don't think at any point in our existence have we have to f fight food, right? Fight against mm -hmm. food. You know, withhold yeah. from food, abstain from food, restrict food, fight industries that have anything to do with food. So I, yeah. I don't, I don't think in well, my lifetime we'll see that fight happen. I, I'm going to be yeah. honest. Yeah, I do often like to think about, you know, there's food and there's product, right? I like to celebrate food, but you know, many of the things that make us sick, they're technically food, but they're more products than their proper food, right? That's true. Well, I mean, that, that's like the uh, age old, I, I agree with you, but uh, uh, I'm working on this uh, council to try to get uh, the term food addiction recognized. And I think we're, uh, uh, we're calling it processed food, right? Yeah. Processed food, yeah, right? Yeah, that makes a ton more sense, yeah. Yeah, it, it makes it easier. I'm not sure it makes more sense, more questions than sense. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> okay, before we leave, you know, all of the, you know, what I'd love is you share with me how people could reach out to you if they're interested in this field or have something to contribute to this field. And I will certainly link to your papers and I appreciate your time. Uh, one last question before you go. What's on your plate for dinner? I already had dinner. Yeah, yeah. What, what was on the plate? 
uh, I think it was a pasta with some French beans, I think they're called. These French sort of beans. long string greens and that kind of sausage thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I mean, I like food, but at the same time, I got two toddlers uh, and a busy household. So yeah. it's not that so, uh, they were yeah. as holy as as any, you know, stringent dietist, dietitian would want me to be. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. No shame. No, no just curious what's on your plate. Uh, I'll have yeah. I'll have some steak and vegetables later. So anyway, cheers. Nice. Luke, thank you so much for coming. I know you're spending time away from your family. I appreciate it. Keep doing the work you're doing. This is important work. And you know, uh, you know, it's important to have people who think like you uh, tackling these problems because, you know, eat less, move more, thermodynamics, calories in, calories out. These type of things haven't worked. Oh, so we need to, yeah. yeah, we need to pivot real quick. And I wish uh, more people could think um, as critically as you are. Thank you so much for having me and um, have a good day in the rest of the day.